we've had an amazing array of presentations uh, this afternoon. We've looked externally, we've had a view from the EU, we've had a view from Westminster, a view from the grassroots, a view from the wider public um, on where how we build bridges and, and where we go next. Um, but we also need, I think, to look within the movement and think uh, think how how do we respond to this new reality? And over the past six months, I and others within the movement have been doing exactly that, thinking about how to build the European movement strength for the next phase of our campaign. Um, and what do we need to do? What 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 resources do we need to to bring to bear um, if we are going to make a difference? Um, and so I'm really delighted to to introduce the next panel, which is going to talk about exactly how we as a movement can be uh, stronger and more effective over the next uh, few years. Um, the chair's going to be, um, the panel is going to be chaired, sorry, by Richard Corbett, who uh, uh, is known to many of you and has been previously chair of the European movement, now uh, vice president, uh, honorary vice president. Um, and he's joined by Dominic Green, QC, um, by Julius Leifter, who's the president of the Young European Movement, and by Molly Scott Cato, um, who has recently joined our national executive and is a, a green, was a green very recently. Um, uh, I look forward to your contribution. Let's hear where we're going next. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honour for me to to host or chair this this um, final session, really, before the the um, keynote speech at the end of the conference. Um, especially as it's the end of what's been a great day with over 3,000 people logging in. It's a bit of a paradox that um, soon after a major defeat, the referendum, the European movement is, is booming in terms of its membership or growing in terms of its membership, the number of branches and so on. And of course, we've been there before as a movement. We are the longest standing pro-European organisation in Britain and indeed we're part of a wider international European movement. And you can go right back in when Britain initially declined to join the coal and steel community. The European movement was in a difficult position. It continued to campaign in circumstances that were not propitious. The same when the EEC was set up. The same when we did apply and de Gaulle vetoed Britain's application. All those times in our history, things looked dire, but the movement kept going, kept on arguing, kept on making the case, and eventually it bounced, it bounced back. Um, we've been there before, and our speakers today will address how we take things forward this time. And I'm looking forward to a fascinating discussion, because it's about how we now take arguments forward. We all share a basic dilemma. Every single one of us would like us to be in the European Union. But we also know that campaigning to rejoin by the end of next year is not politically feasible. How do we balance that? There are, we've seen in the debates today, there are different views, a range of views on this. Um, but can we? marry them? Can we get them to converge on a sensible strategy? I believe we can. There are many things we can argue for to attenuate the particularly bad deal that has been negotiated. We can ally with many people to say who are campaigning already on such issues like rejoining Erasmus, rejoining Europol, having a, a, a phytosanitary deal with the EU. Uh, all kinds of things that would attenuate the situation that we are in, would not eliminate the problems of Brexit, but would at least attenuate some of them. We can join with those campaigns, bring people in. But we also need, in the wider debate in Britain, about our long-term relationship with our European neighbours, we do need a voice saying, one day we must consider rejoining. That must be an ultimate objective. Because in the various voices in Britain in the debate about our relationship with Europe, we need somebody out there making that case. And if not the European movement set up for that, then, then who? Indeed, if we don't, our opponents, those who support, who led us towards Brexit, will start to say, Oh, 
even the European movement isn't talking about ever rejoining the European Union. Even they don't talk about that. That is settled now forever. We cannot let that be the situation. We must keep a voice arguing in favour of rejoining. But we must do it realistically, combined with a step-by-step -step rebuilding of a relationship, bringing us closer to Europe. We've debated that quite a lot in the European movement. You will see on our website what our stand is. It's step by step towards, however, rejoining. Brick by brick, but knowing what we are building. There are different nuances on that, and I look forward now to this debate where we have three excellent speakers, all of whom have been given new prominent roles in the reorganized European movement leadership under Andrew Adonis. First and foremost, of course, is Dominic Grieve, former Attorney General, and in many ways a hero of the European movement for the role that he played in the parliamentary battles in 2017, 18 and 19. The author of the amendment that, re that was carried and required a meaningful vote in Parliament on the final outcome of those negotiations that gave us then leverage to do much more in Parliament and coming oh so close to winning that referendum on the actual outcome, on the actual Brexit that we very nearly achieved. Um, Dominic has just been made ambassador of, head of the European Union, or of the European movement, or should I say head of a team of ambassadors that he will set up. A little bit more than just a speaker's panel, people who will go out there and advocate, who will speak, who will who will make the case and also listen and bring back feedback to the European movement. Then we will have a Julius Leithma, if I've got the pronunciation right, a man close to my heart because I started off in the Young European Movement, which he now is president of. In my case, it was many years ago and in the GEF. Um, Julius comes originally from Austria. He's gone from Austria to Aberdeen, where he's a student, and he leads now the the Young European Movement, which is our future, which is crucial for the future of this, of this whole debate. And last but not least, my former colleague and friend Molly Scott Cato, prominent MEP for many years, representing the southwest of England and Gibraltar, not to forget our colleagues in Gibraltar and what they face. And Molly and I worked cross-party together in the European Movement. We even had flats in Brussels in the same building. So it's a particularly particular pleasure to have her here. And she will be working, has been tasked in the European movement, among other things, of course, to improve our diversity in the European movement in terms of, of ethnic, uh, gender, um, and other forms of diversity, where we must admit the European movement has too many pale, stale old men like myself, and it is time to move on. So first I hand over to Dominic. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be at this conference and to have listened to the other speakers. And I certainly don't want to repeat what some of them have said. I find myself in agreement, for example, with the analysis of Peter Kellner uh, and of Deborah uh, in respect of the realities of where public opinion now is in respect of Brexit having happened. I also find myself in agreement with my good friend and colleague, David Liddington, in his analysis of the sort of road forward. Now, this session is about where we go as a movement. And I think that raises some interesting challenges for us. We have turned into a mass movement. We were not a mass movement in 2016, yet that has been the product of Brexit. Indeed, I wasn't involved with the European movement before 2016 and have got progressively involved with it since. I should have been involved a long time ago. The point that was just made, that in fact, we were a movement for a long time before we joined the EEC, ought also to be in our minds. And yet at the same time, we know that we have a big grassroots membership who would love to see something happen tomorrow, which realistically and politically is not going to be deliverable. So we need to hold faith with our members 
and to give them a sense of optimism, but linked to that, we need some realism about what is achievable. To go back and rejoin the EU means a government that is willing to rejoin the EU and an EU that is willing to have the UK back. Neither is certain and nothing in politics is certain. At the moment, the two main political parties are a million miles from that. How then do we go forward? I just have a few suggestions to make. The first thing, and I think it's come out already in discussion, so I apologize for repeating it, is that we must get away as a movement from seeing Brexit as a binary moment which split the country irrevocably in two, because as the point's been made, it is the people who voted leave who we need to get interested in building closer relationships with our European partners and with the European Union itself. And the truth is that on a cross-party basis, Lots of people, I had an attachment to the old Conservative Party, I know that within my party, from which I was once a member, there are stacks of MPs who regret what's happened, but they've just gone with the flow. There are lots of members who regret what's happened, but are just going with the flow because they don't see any other option. And the same will be happening in Labour as well. So we need to start appealing to them that we have practical ideas that are going to make a significant difference to the well-being of people in this country. David Livington commented on some veterinary harmonization so that you can once again export your Cheshire cheese directly without it going off long before it gets to its European destination. A harmonization of rules or at least improvement of rules so that there's visa-free travel for certain professionals, particularly those in the creative profession so that they can get about. Much better cooperation over security, a willingness to engage on foreign affairs, where actually our views are completely aligned, but in fact, the current government is artificially creating barriers because it doesn't wish to point out the extent to which we've divorced ourselves from our European partners on this issue. And cultural issues like Erasmus. And if I may say so, that's an awful lot to be getting on with. If we can mount credible campaigns and attract in the young to support us, this point has been made so many times in the course of uh, this conference today, then I think the movement has a very bright future. Point was made in introducing us about permanency in politics. There is no permanency. Politicians love to talk about this is a permanent ending to something. It doesn't exist. People might have said 10 years ago that our going into the EEC was a permanency. It wasn't. Our leaving has no permanency to it. The truth is that we are a European nation and we are going to stand and fall with our European partners. Their future and ours is enmeshed and intertwined in a way that goes deeper and further than any other countries on planet Earth. And that is just because of geographical proximity. We can still be proud of our connection to other Western democracies like the United States, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, and indeed others. But the reality is that what goes on in our neighbourhood is what affects us most directly. That's what we have, I think, got to concentrate on. And if we do it in a pragmatic way, and do it on the basis of a growing grassroots movement, and this is where all of you who are listening in this afternoon are so important, then I'm convinced we will make progress. But it's going to require patience, it's going to require determination, and it's going to require being quite subtle in picking the issues which matter to people and where we can show that our ideas are going to make immediate and concrete improvements to them without just calling into question the whole basis of the 2016 outcome. So that's my thoughts for this panel, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Dominic. And now over, over to Julius. You're muted at the moment. Yeah. You still seem to be muted. Um, 
afraid I can't unmute you. Uh, Scott, are you able to assist us? Um, while Scott is trying to sort that, or we need to find Scott, can I just ask Molly, are you, are we able to hear you at the moment? Sure. Can you hear me? Shall we just yeah. swap you around for the time being? Sure. Uh, while, while Scott hopefully um, sorts out the, the muting. Just Thank you very much. Well, it's been an amazing day, hasn't it? And uh, one of the privileges of, of going at the end of the day is that uh, while well, you have to avoid the risk of repeating what other people have said, you can pick up some of the points that have been made earlier on in the conference. And um, I particularly enjoyed the, the session with, with um, Femi and Peter and Deborah, although it was uh, pretty full of hard truths, to be honest. But I think also the session where we had the the creative industries discussing the impact on them and as an economist i have to say that you know the three top industries are creatives finance and food and farming and i feel physically sick honestly when i see the kind of destructive impact of brexit on them and obviously it would look much worse if we weren't living through covid and i know our prime minister very famously said he was going to screw business or rather more impolitely than that but i won't uh, i won't offend your ears but you know, I mean, to have done that so dramatically is something I would never have expected to see a government do. And I think what Peter is right, what we need to do is connect that to people's lives. But I think that is a responsibility. We can't just ignore that and allow that to be written off as something that was COVID related. It's crucially important that we do connect that with Brexit, but in a way that is meaningful for people. In that session, I also very much agree with what Femi was saying about Brexit being the result of broken politics. Um, I refuse to say that there are opportunities in Brexit because I don't think there are, but I do think there are some silver linings. And for me, one of the silver linings is that more people are recognising that we don't live in, in a proper democracy, that we have all sorts of flaws with our system, the, the craziness of the House of Lords, an unfair voting system. And um, I think one of the things that will come out of this process of change that we're going through is that we will become a modern European democracy like the others. And I, I would welcome that day myself. And I think the third difficult thing we've learned today is that this is going to take a long time. And for those of us who are still sort of grieving and wish it wish it hadn't gone like it did a year ago, um, that's a really a really hard lesson. But it is important that we learn that lesson. And I think the way I like to think about it is that in my heart, I will continue to keep that warmth and that belief that we will return to the European Union. But in my head, I have to, and I think we all have to think strategically about the timing and the staging of what we say as we argue for um, what is actually a long road back to European Union membership. So my particular task here in terms of building our own movement is to make sure that the movement itself looks like the society will be when we join the European Union. And I think most of you who, who've come to know the European movement know that that isn't the case at the moment. So Richard used the word diversity, and I would also add to that inclusiveness. But I, I like to think of this as the faces of 2030. I'm being optimistic. I think we'll be back in the European Union in 2030. And our movement needs to be representative of the country we'll be at that time. And so what we're proposing to do is to review our internal structure and our outward communications to ensure that we move towards fulfilling this vision over the next two or three years. And when we talk about the European movement being more inclusive, we're talking about a range of characteristics, but also cultures and modes of communication, our ways of working, our ways of speaking. And that's something that as somebody who's nearly 60 now, you know, I don't have that expertise. I need to reach out to, to Julius and other people to understand how we communicate to a whole range of different people. The sorts of characteristics we're thinking about, uh, Richard's already mentioned, but particularly the, the fact that we've had limited representation of, of women, particularly in the governance bodies of the European movement, a limited number of people from black and ethnic minority groups, younger people, disabled people, working class people, and to some extent, even people from the regions. And that's why it's been very good to, to build out and have the, the grassroots for Europe join us. So um, I'm just going to give a quick shout out to the people who are joining me in this work. We've got Anna and Scott from the staff team, Saj, Saj Karim and Claire Moody, who were both 
MEPs with me, and it's going to be really great to work with them again, and Peter Kellner and Paul Lomas. So please do share your ideas about how this can work. It's a review where we're going to be reaching out across the movement to really revitalise and, and replenish and, and uh, restore the way our movement works and the way it looks. And I believe, I genuinely believe we will rejoin the European Union, and I believe the European Union is the crucial body in making sure that happens. And when we do make sure that happens, we need to be sure that we are reflective of everybody in our country. So that, that's the project. I look forward to hearing what you think about it. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. And we now have a target date from Molly for rejoining in uh, 2030. That's um, only the last possible date, Richard. <laughs> I'd, I'd settle for 2031, but OK. <laughs> Anyway, uh, finally, with apologies for the slight change of order earlier for technical reasons, we, we come to Julius. Over to you. Let's test if you can hear me. Yes. Yes, you can. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot for the invitation. My name is Julius, representing the Young European Movement. We are the uh, youth organization of the European Movement um, and also the UK section of the Young European Movement International, which is called Jeff Europe. Um, and this is basically where I'd like to come in with, with my statement here. Again, trying not to repeat something that you might have already heard, and that is the European connection. I think not only do we need to be diverse and representative uh, of the whole country, we also need to maintain our European links. And this is basically what we are trying to focus on amongst a number of, of, of different activities, which is that we want to connect UK youth um, with um, European continental youth. And I specifically try to avoid European youth uh, because we believe that the UK is part of Europe, um, so it's continental European youth. And the way that we do this is by organizing a number of youth exchanges, by organizing seminars, by organizing meetings that maybe have a, some sort of political or academic background, but also meetings that just focus on culture and cultural exchange, for example. Um, and in terms of the messaging, again, this might be some sort of repetition, but what we really became very, very um, fond of is to not become sort of a continuation of an anti-Brexit campaigning organization. We as the Young European Movement, we have realized um, that we can't continue to go on with the same debate, to continue to make the numbers, um, show the economics, um, show the negative effects, and just basically have the main message that this decision was wrong. Um, but we have to sort of leave this stage, at least for the moment, and try to focus on the more positive. We have to establish an emotional, positive connection with Europe, and we believe that a very effective way of making this happen is by having UK youth actually meet with European youth. As you can imagine, the past 12 months have been rather difficult in that endeavor. Um, we still kept the connection up um, and we are reviving our branches uh, across the country. And this is also where my first invitation goes out to all of you. If you know a young person um, that is um, interested in this or that is potentially interested in this, um, please get in touch with me. Please get in touch with us, connect them to us, and we are willing to make this happen. We, are, we have at the moment around three branches that are really active, about eight branches that are just in the process of being formed. And these are all across the country, from Aberdeen to Exeter, so pretty much the whole diagonal. Um, and, and this is what we, what we really need. And there, we need your support, because at the moment, and this is what was also mentioned, unfortunately, um, young people are very disappointed and to some extent apathetic about political issues at the moment, specifically with regards to Europe. Europe, as you know, is something that we as young people take for granted. We take this for granted. We were never really sort of thinking about the potential of losing it. And now that we lost it, we are extremely disappointed. And we don't see a real chance of change. Because up until 2019, and we heard Femi today, there was a strong European youth movement. And that fell apart. So we are kind of in this vacuum. We are kind of in this space where young people have to be kept European, have to be connected to Europeans, where we have to fight against this, this backlash and against this, this narrative of, of the UK is not European. And we're going to take you out of Erasmus. We're going to take you out of the single market. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to make the divide even bigger. We have to go, we have to tap into that uh, as European movement, as young European movement, and try to fight this narrative. And the way that we're doing this um, is currently being developed. Um, we don't have a recipe for that. We are speaking about certain topics, like, for example, climate where we would like to host um, uh, a training session on, on climate for a couple of days, where I'm sure that the European movement is going to help us organize this as well, because we believe that climate is something where we can show that Europe is actually the place to solve um, common challenges, and that, uh, that it's actually smart 
to combine uh, efforts on a, on a European scale. The second thing that we that we talk about um, is civic participation. Our European umbrella organization is very big on that, for example. And we, we go into we go into schools and we teach about democracy. We teach about how young people can have an impact. And this idea of empowerment is something really, um, really, really important that we focus on. Um, and another thing that we focus on um, and where we can continue to make the case um, is human rights and rule of law. Together with our partner organization, Jeff Europe, we are running a campaign that's called Democracy Under Pressure, where we look at countries both within the European Union, but especially outside the European Union, such as Belarus and Russia, where democracy is being threatened. And this is how we can make young people aware of, of being part of something bigger, despite that they have left the European Union. They have left the European Union, but they haven't left Europe. Um, and just to, to outline one or two more things that we do at the moment, we are also building an Erasmus Advocacy Coalition. This is currently being developed. I'm going to put a link into the chat in just a second, um, because we want to conduct both PR um, as well as real advocacy. We want to meet with politicians. We want, we want to convince mayors to sign petitions, and we want to make the voice as much as possible, as big as possible, so that the UK government at some point realizes that out of pure sanity, the only real vi wise decision, the only viable decision, is to rejoin Erasmus. And we would like to build that pressure with your help. And the second thing that we do is, is the Brexit reality portraits, where we want to enter in-depth conversations with people um, how Brexit has affected them, both in the UK as well as outside. Because once again, we want to make sure that people realize that actually Brexit is something that the whole of Europe cares about. And the amount of support that we receive from other, from our partner sections across the, the channel is actually enormous and has gone up inc incredibly ever since Brexit. And to make that clear, that Europe hasn't forgotten about the UK and young people in Europe haven't forgotten about UK youth, this is our, this is our, key, our key focus. Uh, thanks very much. Well, thank you, Julius. Indeed, thank you for all three speakers. Um, sadly, we don't really, we don't actually have time for questions and answers now because um, due to the accumulation of running late throughout the day, which is normal in a conference like this, we are slightly behind schedule and, uh, and I don't want to, to hold things up. But I want to thank you for those contributions which, which well illustrated what we are wrestling with as we go forward as a European movement. And I'm glad that uh, Julius pointed out that if we did ever change our minds in the foreseeable future to come back, that Europe would welcome us. I, that's my experience as well, provided they were convinced that we weren't about to embark on going through this whole process again. We really have to convince British public opinion. But, you know, there have been cases in our history where public opinion has completely turned around on something that it initially supported. Think about Suez. Think about Iraq. It could happen as well on Brexit if this is genuinely seen as a national mistake that was made. And we must encourage public opinion to move in that direction because if it does so, it will help us whether we are trying to build new bridges, build back a relationship brick by brick, or whether we want to go further. Either way, bringing public opinion with us is essential. Thank you very much. I hand over. I hand back now to to Anna, um, who will now take us in to the next and final stage of uh, of our conference today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Richard, and thank you to uh, to Molly, to Julius, and to Dominic, um, and for all their commitment to the European movement. Um, they have a job to do going forward to take us into the new world, um, and we are very lucky to have their commitment and their contribution.